Welcome back. Australia have been crowned world champions after comfortably beating England in the final in Africa's first World Cup in Cape Town. Jamaica beat defending champions New Zealand to the bronze medal, while South Africa finished sixth behind Uganda. The tournament has been hailed as a round of success by our stakeholders. And our reporter, uh, Lebo, Lebo Hang Dube, is on the ground to give us a wrap of the tournament. Lebo, I understand you have a couple of guests there, but before we get to them, uh, South Africa definitely did not get to the result that they were hoping, both, hoping for. But for you, what has been the highlight being there from the beginning? Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, I think the highlight is that it was a first World Cup on the African continent and it was a success. Uh, we saw exciting matches. We saw uh, fans coming out in numbers. I don't think there was a single game where there was no electrifying atmosphere inside the uh, courts. So I think it was also um, you know, made special by those that came, uh, not only South Africans, but everyone you know, around the world. Um, you know, every part of the of the world was was uh, represented here uh, in Cape Town, and I think the organisers really went out of their way to ensure that uh, it became a success. Uh, but I think it was also disappointing that the home team, uh, the hosting country, uh, didn't make the last four of the tournament, and uh, perhaps even more disappointing that it was you know the objective to try and reach the semi-finals. But overall, an exciting tournament. Um, with Australia and England reaching the finals, uh, with uh, Jamaica being uh, crowned or in fact finishing third uh, and receiving that bronze medal. So overall I think it, it was quite an interesting and a special uh, tournament and just going into this particular final and trying to dissect you know, the result and the performance of the two teams between England and Australia, I'm joined by our analysts. Uh, Sino and uh, Sandy, Sandy, and um, just to, to 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 break down, you know, the performance of the of the Australian team, uh, dominant in the third and fourth quarter. Uh, you know, they've really uh, built up, you know, momentum, uh, reaching the final and eventually crowning it. But perhaps, if you can just give us a reflection of the game uh, that we've just seen. Thank you so much, Lebo. So that game, it is what we expected to see, right? So by that, it's the result that we expected to see. Um, Australia and New Zealand came guns blazing at the beginning. And that first half, we still looked, or it still looked like England still stood a chance. But again, from the third and the fourth quarter, that's when Australia took it away. And as we always say in the, na in the, um, in the game of netball, that the third quarter is the championship's quarter. And that is the difference where Australia actually took it away. You know, I always think about it. I'm like, what kind of books does Australia read? What do these players say to each other on court? Because something pulls them together at the right time. And if you look at the Australian team from the beginning of this tournament, I, in my opinion, think that that is the only team that has actually you know, started building from where they started off. We would have thought that, you know, they had a slow start, but they started building with each and every game. And in each game, they build from first quarter. You see them getting better in the second quarter. And something also very interesting that I saw, and I think we should take, you know, a page out of uh, that, that coach's um, book over there, the number of times that she kept putting on fresh legs and I think I spoke about this earlier saying that you know sometimes uh, the players are fatigued and you just need to f uh, put in fresh legs even if you feel like your starting seven is, is doing what they need to do sometimes it's better to be on the bench see what's going on so you can see what you need to do when you come on and that's that's just what uh, the Australian team did and that's what they do they've won this thing 11 times they were going to win it for a 12th time would you say it's a, it's a situation where they were the more consistent uh, team in the tournament? 100%. And the thing is with the game of netball label is that it's 60 minutes. So you, you, you don't get to you have a, a 15 minutes and then a half time you let the ball drop. And it, it's very difficult to come back from a team like um, Australia. I watched it. I saw when they starting pull, started pulling away. If you have a margin of about five goals with Australia, I can tell you now that it is not, it's going to be hard for you to come back with those defenders at the back that I always speak about and even the front the other uh, other end of the Australian team uh, the uh, Stacey uh, the Australian uh, coach had the, the the option of of putting in a combination that we haven't seen much of took out a Steph Wood and, and took out a, a Co um, Conan but it was like the next combination that you put in was perfect it's being able to have that depth in your bench that whenever you put anyone on they do what they need to do.
And Sandy, just to speak about uh, the English uh, team, um, you know, they, they've really, you know, built up as well throughout the tournament. They've really done well for themselves reaching the final. Uh, would you say that, uh, you know, the overall performance was an impressive one? Yes, of course. I don't think England should go back home feeling disheartened or sad about this. They were unbeaten up until the final. Who can be that consistent? Now, the question is, what exactly happened today? What happened leading up to what implementations, development, exercises and, and other regimes did they put into place um, for today's final? We don't know that. I mean, just what Sino said, we don't know what Australia has done and we would all love to know how is it that they're able to walk away with this title time and time again, despite the fact that we see other teams being just or matching they play and they tempo throughout the entire tournament. England put up a good fight in my opinion, but unfortunately Australia has a neck for pulling away in the third and fourth. And if you're going to allow a goal difference of three and more, Australia capitalizes on that. And that's exactly what we saw again today, which is a repeat of every other World Cup. Australia just has something, something in the third and the fourth, and we have yet to find out what it is. And, and speaking about uh, the third and the fourth quarter, I mean, when you look at, at England in those two quarters, uh, at some, in some instances, I mean, they were not clinical as, as they were supposed to be and, and, and uh, punished. That is for certain. There was a lot of unforced errors. Uh, I believe they didn't capitalize on a lot of rebounds and, well, once Australia sees you lacking in certain areas, I believe they go full force and they shut those areas. And areas I believe they could have done so much better in is their defensive side as well as their mid-court. Australia is known for that diamond defense that just penetrates um, all the attackers and just breaks down. And that's what we also saw. We saw that their shooters were also losing a lot of confidence. And that's when we started seeing that the shooters were not capitalizing and not shooting. A lot of their passes that were being sent into the circle were being either second guessed or just not reaching the shooters and Australia capitalized on that and just to quickly wrap up and perhaps in 30 seconds from your side your overall uh, reflection of the tournament overall it was definitely an interesting tournament we saw a lot of historic events and a lot of historical numbers if I could say in terms of people and support I personally did not think that Nepal SA was going to bring out this many South Africans time and time again and that gives a sense of excitement of what the future holds for netball in South Africa. And Sino, from your side? For me, it was, it was an amazing experience. Uh, it was nice to see the fans come out. And I think we, we did a really good job first in the African continent. And like I said, I think a while back is that people are now going to know that uh, um, netball is a sport in South Africa. And I also really hope that it opens doors for our South African players to go overseas, to get that exper uh, uh, experience, to build up. You know, we've got four years to the next World Cup. So I'm really looking forward to see what the World Cup is going to do for our country, netball. Ladies, thank you very much for being our uh, analyst for the duration of the tournament. It was a pleasure speaking to you and getting that knowledge from your side. And as we wrap up here at the CTICC for SABC, not yet a wrap. Tomorrow morning uh, we'll be live on Table Mountain with Morning Live to wrap up the tournament as we speak to the Proteas, we speak to the Deputy Minister of Sport, we speak to Netball South Africa. So you can catch that tomorrow morning on Morning Live. Coming to us live from Cape Town, wrapping up the Netball World Cup, 2023 Netball World Cup, that is, which has been won by Australia alongside Sino as well as Sandy Siwa, our Netball analyst right here on Sports Live.